You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to Tone Benders, where we talk with the sonic artists behind our favorite films, games, and series. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I will be your guide through a talk about designing sounds from Earth's distant past. You know, sounds like dinosaurs and spaceships. Wait, that must mean we're talking about the new sci-fi film 65, where a ship from a futuristic society crash lands on a prehistoric Earth to battle dinosaurs with laser rifles and future tech. This is a kind of sound design project I don't know that anyone's ever tackled before, and I can't imagine it would be anything but a ton of fun. Today we're joined by the film's supervising sound editor, Steven Tickner. You were on quite a run recently with Spider-Man No Way Home, The Terrifying Barbarian, and now 65. Welcome to the show, Steven. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Thanks for making all those great movies. Um, also joining us today is Michael Babcock. Listeners might recall Michael's previous appearance on Tone Meters, where we talked about the trial of the Chicago 7. Michael was the re-recording mixer on 65. It's great to have you back, Michael. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you, too. So uh, one of the main features of 65 is that there's dinosaurs in it. A problem or maybe a feature of cutting sound for dinosaurs is what uh, some people call the Gary Rydstrom problem or the Jurassic Park problem. That movie was done so well with the dinosaur roars that it just ingrained all of us in society of what a dinosaur sounds like. This sound no one has ever heard. We all know exactly what it sounds like because of that franchise. So when you go to tackle new dinosaurs, you obviously don't want to just make it sound exactly the same, but it also can't be drastically different. It has to be somewhat within that world. Steven, do you want to talk about how you and your team kind of tackled the dinosaur issue? You know, when you look at the actual visual effects, uh, anytime when it comes to sound, that really is the, the trigger is what we look at really triggers our minds on what we need to create. Now, obviously, when this started, it was a lot of pencil sketching. So you just saw a previs of what these creatures were supposed to look like. And in many ways, the directors went out of their way to try to put in creatures from prehistoric Earth that weren't necessarily in other movies. Obviously, there's one or two, but in general, they just said, we want to try to create a different landscape but also obviously create the same type of fear and tension that you would get if you were stuck in a, in a world that is basically trying to eat you alive. We really had our work cut out for us because when you watch a film and you listen to a movie, you really don't want to be distracted. You want to be enjoying the movie. You want to be part of the film. And in my opinion, um, we put our job on the screen and we hope that, you know, it just feels natural. So that was really the 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 approach that we all took. You mentioned the movie that is, you know, sound wise is very iconic. So it's a combination of obviously you have to have something that works, but it's it's also an opportunity to immerse yourself in in a world. And what was nice about this movie is that um, there's all kinds of things going on. It's it's uh, certainly dinosaurs and creatures, but it's also environments. And you have this whole tech going on. Like you have a spaceship. I mean, Jurassic Park didn't have a it had some tech in it, but it was, you know, modern day tech. So there's this whole other, you know, facet that you get a chance to kind of be be comfortable with. So you're not necessarily it, I mean, luckily, it's the movie itself, the story, you don't have to. You know, you can actually kind of not have to reference what's really been established with with that movie. Actually, in the intro, uh, you said a word that I wanted to acknowledge. You said, uh, you know, future tech, future sci-fi. And actually, it's kind of not. It's it's tech and it's sci-fi, but it's coming up with sounds that are, I, I'm, I guess the word would be timeless. Because... Technically, this happened 65 million years ago. So it's this, and and that I mean that informs the mixing decisions too. It's it's like what is what is the thing here? Whether it's music or whether it's a, what sound effects, what makes it the most timeless thing? I, I think for us that was kind of a way of not being intimidated by a very established like everyone knows what a T Rex sounds like. <laughs> Um, so that way, what, what can we do to, you know, take it to the next level? What can we do to make any of these choices timeless? Obviously, classic movies, we always strive to respect and honor these films that have done such great work. Also, the reality of it is, too, for us, thankfully, I think we're 
me especially, I feel very lucky because we're in an industry that the technology and the tools of creating sound and mixing sound and making sounds and even visually seeing the visual effects have, have progressed so much. In some ways, the bar gets raised every time and we have to be challenged to do that type of work because in essence, the studios are giving us a responsibility to make sure their high budget films are being treated well. And then we have two great directors, Scott and Brian. Scott Beck and Brian Woods. Who are like sitting with us day after day, um, becoming, in a way, we become a small family. And they trust us to bring to them the sonic landscape that they envision. And truthfully, if we didn't have all of these toys to play with, and they're not toys. I mean, there's, these are real tools. But as Michael will say, I mean, if it wasn't for the progress of Dolby Atmos and Pro Tools and third-party software plugins and third-party integration of all this technology, uh, I don't know what the sonic landscape would sound like today compared to the way it was 30 years ago. To add to that, I mean, the less sexy answer is, I, I feel like this movie is kind of a demo of Do what Dolby Atmos can really be because it has immersive quiet scenes, has super dynamic scenes. No channel or speaker or part of the theater was left behind <laughs> in this. So well said, Steve. It, it definitely I agree. It's like we had to use every single tool possible. And even if that meant sonic landscape <laughs> as far as, you know, where it's placed, where it is. That's an interesting point, because like if uh, someone is a. Uh approaching this film, having seen the trailer and stuff, you're expecting giant noises, huge sound. But one of the plot points in the film is that there's only two people and they don't speak a shared language. So there's actually very little dialogue throughout the film. And that leaves lots of space to explore the atmos around you and really use the sound effects and the ambiences to engulf and build some of that tension because they're not vocalizing what's going on most of the time. How, how did you go about tackling that? Maybe start with that, Stephen? Well, I can tell you right now that there wasn't any overtime for the di dialogue editor either. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. They literally, it was pretty straightforward. It was like, it was a gift. <laughs> Here you go. Here's a movie with two people and, you know, uh, try not to screw this up. All right. <laughs> but, um, you know, what? what's most important is, and Mike had to do all of the dialogue mixing, was... Um, that there was some reshoots and dialogue and temp dialogue that was done at, you know, people do temp dialogue now in an iPhone. And Mike had to be handed all of this material and say, here, make it work so nobody knows what's what. So it's clean and it's it's smooth. And I think that was really the challenge because, you know, this film has, you know, multiple locations in it and it all had to sound clean. And that just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of great mixing. It's true. I mean, it, you're 65 million years ago, so if nothing can sound like it's it's really of this world. I don't mean to skip around, but this is such a fun movie to work on because you're having conversations about, well, would this kind of cricket be there 65 million years ago? Would, would this kind of bird be there 65 million years ago? So the dialogue has to be clean -eam. And a lot of this is performance based and some of it's even movement and not necessarily English. It's just like harumphs and, and groans and, you know, what efforts. <laughs> so making sure that's not distracting. And, you know, that was all done on set. And Adam Driver is certainly a very performance based actor. So it's a fun challenge, but you really have to make sure that that stuff is super clean in a, in a movie like this. <laughs> And what about ambiences? How did you tackle the ambiences? Obviously, there can't be any distant planes in the background, but also you, you have to figure out what kind of animals to include other than just winds, I guess. Well, I think what happens is, is that you're blending a lot of tracks of audio. And as you're listening to it, you think everything's right, perfect, and none of it is always perfect. And then you're sitting on the stage and you're mixing the film and you hear, let's say, in the background, a crow. And then someone goes, oh, shit, what's that? That's a crowd. No, we got to get rid of that. And that's the blessed part about being on a large dub stage with multiple people is everybody is listening for something different. Even though we're all paying attention to the same picture, we all hear things differently. So I think that's that's really where the expertise comes in, where, you know, you can't have that sitting at home. 
You can't have that sitting in a small room. You know, we're we're very lucky, and God willing, it stays this way, to make movies. And when we make movies with big screens, there's really good reasons why we sit in big rooms. And part of it would be one of those reasons, because, you know, you pitch down tracks, you use third-party software to try to create new, new ambiences, but you also may hear things that sound actually quite like normal, like something you created all of a sudden sounds like a howling wolf and it really wasn't. But now that you created it, it does. And the director may say, does that sound like a wolf to you guys? You know, there weren't wolves then let's get rid of that. And you're like, Oh shit, that's something that I just made. And and it, it's not a wolf, but sure sounds like a wolf and he's right. And let's get rid of it. And I think that that's part of the thing you hear, especially in big stages with Atmos speakers everywhere. Um, in a lot of detail with a lot of, you know, your picture editors there, your, you know, Marion Brandon was our picture editor and so was Jane Tones. They really were, uh, you know, listening for everything because they were so familiar with the picture, but now all the sounds new. And then Mike's sitting there mixing and listening to all the music. And sometimes the music may sound like sound effects. So we have to sit there in a group and try to really craft a film. I and mean, it just takes time and, and it's nice to be with people. I have to say, especially after the last few years we've had. I think my job here is just to add less sexy answers to stuff. (laughs) And since this is a a podcast that a lot of like sound people listen to that when it came to dialogue, there's a lot of reliance these days and for good reason on lav mics. The thing about lav mics to my ear, you get a lot of things from lav mics. You get a lot of warmth. You get a lot of, you know, close up miking on someone who's in a, a, you know, a well blocked shot or whatever, like a, a, a wide shot. To me, lav mics never sound natural. That may be just me. To me, they never just sound like a natural part of what they're in the scene. So it was actually super challenging for what little dialogue there was, or if there's movement, to make sure there is movement going on and to make them sound like they're naturally in the shot because they're in a clearly like 100% untouched natural environment. So making that sound like it's for real and keeping their performance not just because I actually find sometimes lav mics if they're super exposed feel distracting to to me this is what's so cool about this movie is because you're having discussions that you don't always have on other kinds of sound jobs well there are long sequences in this film where the only thing that would be on the dialogue channels is heavy breathing grunts as they like jump over logs and stuff like that exactly and i and i want to say um 90 7% Seven percent of what's in the movie is that was on set. In even even the breathing, there there are a couple of little ADR things that had to come in and out of. But I, I'll just say the ADR mixing on this show was very easy. <laughs> Impressive. Let's kind of uh, do a little bit of an anatomy of a scene, if you will. The final sequence in the film has everything in it (laughs) it's got a spaceship crashing off a cliff it's got two dinosaurs uh fighting each other at points it's got asteroids raining down all around us it's got uh, geothermal geysers exploding uh, both close up and far away oh yeah and music it's a very impressive sequence with so much happening the problem with that is that if you can't find holes here and there to bring things down for a moment, it's it's a frying pan to the head. So how do you go about building the sequence where so much is happening, but not make it too overwhelming? Sequences like that is truly about going from cut to cut. It's about what is important in this cut, what is important in this cut, what's telling the story in this cut, and wh- what is the exact sound that has to go right there that you're you're focused on. Making it as clean as possible. And, and that goes for music, not just for all the sound design. It's, um, this might be an element we don't need. <laughs> this might be an element that is competing uh, EQ-wise with something that's going on. And we were given some liberty to make those decisions pretty eh, aggressively. That whole sequence could have been a mess. And it could have been a a sonic mess. I mean, it's super impressive on screen. It's super cool. But it also can be, it goes on for a certain period of time. So it could also be taxing. So it is, it's being clean, but it's also picking your dynamics and when to make it loud, when to make it super impactful, when to use the low end and and, uh, try to be sparing with certain like higher, you know, mid range frequencies. Cause there's a fatigue factor that you're just like, you're over, you'd be overwhelmed if you, 
didn't do something like that. I also think that what I call it is a speaker real estate. I, I like to refer to it that way because sound doesn't always necessarily have to be where you think your brain needs to put it because your brain kind of does tricks for you. So if you can spread things out and sometimes not use that center speaker for everything and move things to different parts of the room, you actually can play the audio much lower and it still feels as dynamic and as as powerful as you would want it to be because now we have more speaker real estate versus doing a 5-1 mix, which was great at the time. There was just so much you had to just squeeze through. You couldn't, you know, you didn't have this, oh, let's put it in the ceiling. Let's put it off to the, the sides. Let's boom the, the rear instead of boom the front. And you have that today. So it really makes a difference in these bigger action sequences. How do you go about breaking down the elements with your sound effects editorial crew? Like, are you giving one person the asteroids, one person the dinosaurs? How how do you go about that, Steve? It depends on the circumstances. For example, you know, when you're getting ready for a temp dub, you're in your very first temp dub, you're basically just hauling ass, just trying to get something in the movie so that it works. On a film like this, you you want to refine it and basically say, okay, one person does the dinosaurs. And I, I had a guy named Ben Cook do all of the dinosaurs for us because he, you know, I wanted to have consistency. That was one of the things that I needed to do was to create consistency so that, you know, this was the, the biggest part of the um, movie. I said, here's the dinosaurs. Go, do, do your thing, especially the baby dinosaur because that visually kept changing because it started off with, it was bigger. And then they said, well, make it smaller. Then they said, make it smaller. Now make the vocal smaller. And it was constantly a very, one of those things that had to get to a place where they felt like, okay, now this, this works. And you want one person who's basically focusing on that, on a film like this. On other movies, it's different. On other movies used to say, here's your reel, go to it. I've always believed in working as a community. So even though you're on one reel, doesn't mean you're going to be on that whole reel the entire time. I think everybody has something to add when they're creating, a, crafting a sound. Everybody has a different point of view. And it takes a long time to see other people's points of view and respect it and then and and know that it's really quality work. And I love that. And I love giving you know somebody that sense of identity that this is their work. So, you know, at some point it gets to the stage and you just let the stage do their thing and it, and it feels great. Uh, ultimately, to your question, on a film like this, somebody did the dinosaurs and then we just broke up the reels. So the only thing that was separated from this movie was the dinosaurs. Everything else was a, a you know, reel by reel job. Cool. The creators of this film, one of their previous projects was A Quiet Place, which was an iconic film, both as a film and for sound. It made a lot of people really think about the sound that don't normally think about film sound at all. Uh, So they obviously have an ear for it and have a prioritization of sound in their films. Uh, Do you want to talk about maybe what's different about their approach versus uh, the standard approach or other approaches that you've dealt with with uh, your directors and producers? Those two guys are world builders. I mean, they're they're um, they're really students of watching. I think every movie they can get their hands on, and, and they're they're writers, and they also come up with great stories along with this world building that they do. And that gives them a unique luxury. So when they're writing a script, they're not necessarily writing dialogue some of the time. They're they're writing action because they're building a world. To me, that makes them unique in in that respect because they can do both the things. They they can have debates about what people are talking about in dialogue. There are debates of what's going on in, in in the world. So that's what I think sets them apart. You know, Quiet Place is a great example of just how sound can be used as a major storyteller of the movie. And and this one's no different. I, and I think at some point we may have even ask them. You know, is this is this kind of your thing? You gravitate towards less dialogue and more sound? And their answer wasn't necessarily no. They're just looking to build whatever world there is. And if that's dialogue, great. If it's sound effects, great. If it's visual effects, great. And they're just thinking in a bigger picture. And they draw from all their experience from just really everything they've watched. And those two guys have been doing this since they were 10. I think they met 
you know, in, in grade school. And, you know, they're the best of friends also from Iowa. So when it comes to doing a landscape with any director, it's always kind of like a work in progress because in many ways, they're not sure exactly what they want. So now we have two directors, which they feed off of each other because they're like brothers. They've they've known each other, like, like Mike said, since high school. So you really have to be like very attentive to what they're saying when you're spotting with them and listening to their ideas. And then you have to get into a, a flow where, you know, I always feel it's really important that they come into um, either an editorial room or like a, a nice sound design stage to preview material. Because what normally happens on a dub stage is, is that the music's the last thing they hear because they just scored it. And the score sounds one way on a scoring stage, and it sounds a little different on a dub stage because it's being mixed for the movie versus just being performed with 100 performers. So they're always focusing on that music because it's the new thing for them. And I want it to always be the new thing for them versus them not hearing sound effects before they get to a dub stage because that then confuses the crap out of them because now they're hearing new sounds and they're hearing new music. So what you try to do is play the material, feed off what they like and don't like before you get to the final. And then you can craft about, I would say, 95 to 97% of a movie before you're finaling. And of course, there's always going to be things that change on a stage, new visual effects. The screen is 50 feet. You see more things than you ever thought you would think you'd see, but you do. And you craft the sound that way. And I think that's the approach that, I, that I've always taken with every director, except that now you have two guys that are, are giving you two sets of different notes. One director likes low-end sounds, and one director likes high-end sounds. And one director's focused on dialogue, one's uh, focused on effects. And you see it in their notes. And then one's got a bunch of music notes and the other one has no music notes. And thankfully, they're great guys. So you just, you go with the flow and then and then you have your picture editor's notes. And you just work your way through a movie. The magic that I've always found is so fascinating to me about sound we're so focused on every frame and every scene. And then all of a sudden we tie the movie together and we play the film. And I always say, wow, did we do that? That's pretty cool. And you don't realize it because you're so focused. It's like building a, a 3000 room hotel. Every room is different until you walk through it. You just don't know what you've done. But what I'm saying is as a whole piece, it really is like incredibly rewarding. Amazing. I would like to uh, offer my congratulations on a very specific moment in the film. There's a jump scare moment about maybe a third of the way in where our main character is looking down a hill. And uh, I'm trying not to give it away for if anyone hasn't seen the film, but I jumped about six feet in the air and everyone around me in the theater did too. It was a perfectly crafted moment. And uh, I'm wondering if maybe, Michael, if you want to talk about the way that you build the sound of a jump scare, because in order for the loud sound to grab you, it has to be quiet before it, obviously, but it has to get quiet without the audience noticing it gets quiet at the same time. Do you want to talk about maybe how you build those? That's a unique jump scare. And it was a challenge to, to figure out the sound of that because there's a lot of things going on in that shot. Bec there's a misdirection going on because you're, you're focused on something that is in the distance and you have this awe thing going on in the distance. And if you look at that shot, if you know where to look in that shot, sound or no sound, you're challenging the fact that a jump scare is going to work. That was designed on, on purpose visually. So getting the exact timing right of when you hear the thing, it isn't necessarily even when you see it. There is a moment that we all just agree like, oh, that's where you put the sound because you also can't completely like you can in certain horror movies where you can really, you know, hit digital zero without b making too obvious and then scare the crap out of everybody with, with a jump scare. This is not one of those kind of moments. You have to have that same you know, effect. But you, if you're pulling stuff down because you have all kinds of backgrounds going on, you have, you know, those huge dinosaurs trudging in the distance and you even have some music that's at that's misdirecting the awe of that shot. It's really well crafted visually and which made it sonically very 
challenging um, to be able to make that a jump scare. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take the win because it, it it worked. The theater that I was in, everybody jumped. We should be super proud of that shot because yes, there is a big dynamic change to help that that jump scare. But it's not this ridiculous over the top. There's a big bass kettle drum. Like it's just the event, and um, so we didn't necessarily, you know, overdo it or or just kind of push the jump scare. Because and that happens, you know, too often in, in some horror movies where you're you're there for a jump scare. You're there to go see a horror movie for a jump scare. So you have some of these jump scares that are a little out of control. Like you're just like, you're testing the limits of what a sound system can do in that moment. And uh, this one was not that. Um, it, it really is not that loud of a moment. It just has the perfect sound at the perfect time. <laughs> a lot of things about this movie were just really fun. It wasn't as well-reviewed a movie as I expected it to be because it's just fun. I don't know what people had a problem with it because... It's short, so you're not investing a ton of time in the film, which is a problem with a lot of movies these days, is, you know, uh, can't afford the babysitter to go see the movies anymore because it's four and a half hours long, it feels. But this movie is a tightly packed, compact movie with good acting. The jump scares were great. Sound effects were great. It, it was a really fun ride. So uh, congratulations on what you pulled off with it. It was a really fun movie, and I had a great night out at the cinema. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, and any time, man. Right, thanks, Tim. Hey all, that was a fun talk. Because I had some health issues this spring, we had an unexpected hiatus for the podcast. As we get rolling again, I realized I never thanked all our Los Angeles listeners for the amazing turnout at the Tonebenders meetup we had at the end of February in LA. So many people came out, it completely blew my mind. The lineup to buy a drink at the bar became completely ridiculous. I met so many wonderful people that night, the community of sound people all around the world, but in LA especially, is so amazing. Hopefully we can do it again next year. Thanks to everyone that came out and made it such a fun night. On behalf of Mike and Steven from 65, my name is Tim Muirhead. Thanks for listening to Tone Benders. Talk to you soon. Tone Benders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Are you looking for more audio related podcasts to listen to? Tonebenders is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. How it's going to be once it gets on the streaming services, it's going to have a whole new life. It's going to have a big life on, on streaming. And also, I think it's one of those, I, I call it the system checker. Like, hey, do you want to check out my home theater? Like, I think it's actually one of those movies. It is, totally. I hadn't thought about it that way, but for sure. The sequel will either be 66 or the prequel will be 64. So it's really simple. Yeah, so many ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.